I've made a lot of mistakes in my 10 years of watercolor practice. There are three in particular that I had to learn the hard way and I will share them in this video so you don't have to go through these frustrations on your own. Avoid accidents and get better results in your watercolor painting. Number one is leaving wet edges. So here I painted a stripe using my favorite Thylo Blue and now while it's still drying I will paint another stripe with magenta just barely touching the blue section. Both of my mixtures are similar in terms of water to paint ratio, but the blue had a little bit more time to dry and you can clearly see the blue pigment rushing over to the pink side and starting to spread there. But if you want sharp edges between different colored objects or sections, I recommend at least an hour or even two of drying time or at the very least good 15 minutes so if your paint does spread it doesn't go too far. You can see me doing this on many flowers where I paint by skipping the petals and leaving blank petals in between. This way I can work on a petal or a section that has no other freshly painted edges around. Note that you can have a similar scenario but with a different outcome where if you're painting a very light subject, let's say super light blue and you have a very watery mixture there, very little pigment and this section of course will take a long time to dry. If you start painting something else with a more intense saturated color, a mixture where you use less water and more pigment like I'm doing here with my thick magenta, the new color will flow into the first section you just painted which may potentially completely ruin your work. This happened to me more times than I'm willing to admit here. It takes some time to get used to this, especially if you're trained in a different medium like me, but with watercolors our pigments always flow to those areas that are more wet, regardless of where you place your brush. And what this means practically is when you're painting different sections with different colors and you don't allow enough drying time, the colors will bleed into each other and they will most likely bleed into the most recent and the most wet section that you just painted. To avoid this cross-contamination and keep your edges clean, you really need to allow enough drying time. Unless of course you're interested in this blending effect specifically because it is quite beautiful, although rather unpredictable. So in this bird, for instance, I was very much interested in this kind of loose blend of colors between the red and the green feathers on the belly. So you can see I slowly connected them in the middle. And by the way, I'm working on a large composition featuring poppies and uh, this little bird. It will be our July tutorial on Patreon where we will paint together in real time. So join me if you love botanical work and painting birds or just generally love watercolors and want to try something new and intricate with detailed instructions of course. Now back to our watercolor challenges and things we want to avoid. Number two is incorrect water ratio. This is something that very often gets in the way of a successful wet on wet technique, meaning putting wet paint on previously painted surface that is still wet. You can use different pigments here and it's the best way to create gorgeous soft color transitions. And this is where your water ratio can often be confusing. I can do an entire lecture on wet on wet but I wanted to tell you one thing specifically that many beginners overlook just like I did for the longest time. So keep in mind that more saturated color mixtures will slow down and often prevent wet on wet pigment flow. On the other hand, lighter, more watery mixtures encourage crazy paint flow and as you can see here, my magenta is flowing fast in every direction on the left hand side where I used a lot of water and just a hint of violet. On the other hand, here on the right, my magenta barely spreads because my purple has a lot more pigment and a lot less water. You can try this using the same background pigment, so more water and less magenta here for a lighter effect and the same amount of water but much more pigment here. 
and you can see clearly my DAX design purple is having a hard time spreading on the right hand side. It's important to know that just like in the previous example, you can use this to your advantage. If you want subtle hints of different color, wet on wet, use less water, more pigment, or alternatively, you can wait a little bit longer to allow your water to get absorbed and start drying out. Either way works. It works great for feather textures, for example, and of course, for any background color mix, you can always play around with drying time to better control how fast and how far your pigment spreads. We've covered this in detail last week in this tutorial, which I will link in the description below. It's a great way to time your pigment flow and really understand what your paper can do with watercolors. Lots of you enjoyed that video and exercise, and I really appreciate your feedback. Mistake number three is not being aware or simply not paying attention to pigment coating. And for me, this caused all sorts of confusion and unexpected results when I first started learning about this medium. There are lots of things that typically go along with every tube or watercolor pan you buy, light fastness and staining properties. But I want to focus specifically on granulation because it can instantly, and I mean instantly, change the entire look of your painting. So granulation is basically when bits and particles of watercolor pigment gather together rather than spreading evenly on wet paper. And with very little interference, for example, just by tilting your page slightly or with a bit of clear water drops, like I'm doing here with my green, you can get crazy effects. You will not get these results with non-granulating watercolors like my quinacridon magenta on the left. And so you need to anticipate whether this granulation will happen and whether you really want it because you can, of course, use it to your advantage as well. And more on that later. So being a self-taught watercolor artist, I totally didn't understand this aspect at first. It's really embarrassing. Not really. I'm not mad at myself because I had no idea why it was so important. I was simply experimenting and trying pigments based on how much I liked our particular hue, expecting them to behave in a consistent way, completely overlooking this granulation thing. And I do believe that real hands-on practice is the most important thing for your learning, but doing research helps as well. So this led me to some embarrassing results, including my struggles with ultramarine, which is super granulating and I've documented many of my ultramarine struggles here on this channel early on before I knew better. All that is to say with time I did proper research and I realized what granulation meant and I started using granulating pigments strategically where I want that strong effect and I highly encourage you to consider this aspect when you try out a tube of new paint. They don't often list granulation on the tubes, so do check either on the website or a dot chart. I love dot charts. It usually looks like a capital G. For example, on this Windsor Newton dot chart, you can find it next to every pigment sample. And I have an entire tutorial here on YouTube and on Patreon about using granulating pigments, where I show you two of my favorites that are absolutely perfect for greenery and are really beginner friendly. They create gorgeous results instantly without much effort on your part. And the granulation sort of does all the work for you, creating gorgeous texture. And lastly, don't forget that even non-granulating pigments or slightly granulating pigments can sometimes create texture and blooms, not as defined as granulating, but definitely visible. And the darker, the more saturated mixture you have, the more pronounced this effect will be.
So I hope you learned from my mistakes and maybe you already knew these things. If you want me to talk more in depth about some of the things and challenges that I've encountered in the beginning of my watercolor journey, do let me know in comments below. And of course, check out the wet on wet timing exercise. It will help you master the timing of your strokes and get the best out of your watercolor paper. I will see you next week with some red poppies and a brand new tutorial. Have a wonderful week ahead. Thank you for watching and painting with me.